Well. So our first uh, presenter this morning is Paul Redding. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Sydney, and he's the author of Thoughts, Deeds, Words, and the World, Hegel's Idealist Response to the Linguistic Metacritical Invasion, as well as many other works on Kant, Hegel, and idealism. So I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Kate. Um, now, I, I've got the ability to share my screen. Is that right? Um, no, it says host disabled. So I, I need my um, my presentation. So can I have? You should be able to share now. Okay, right. Um, Oops, somehow came in midway. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I've got a little timer here. Um, and thanks very much, um, Dean, and um, for putting all this together. Um, and it's a real pleasure to uh, participate um, uh, in the celebration of, of Terry's work. Um, Terry, having been one of the proximal causes of my getting drawn into this um, orbit. <laughs> um, so in the paper that I distributed, I had set out to combine what I thought were two aspects of the conference. So the tribute to Terry and the focus on Hegel's philosophy of right. And it's pretty clear that I failed at each of those in the draft that I submitted. So the talk will be an attempt to type of pick out what I um, what was on my mind and worked through it in a somewhat more um, uh, coherent way. So, um, okay, the, 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 the sort of initial idea was um, taking up Terry's idea of Hegel's naturalism as a disenchanted Aristotelian naturalism, um, which seems to me to be um, really uh, sort of has advanced the sort of way of thinking about um, the relationship of mind to nature. Um, but I, uh, I've always got a thing about Aristotle. Uh, and this is, um, this is probably the influence of uh, John Finley, who um, David and I were just talking about. Um, Finley thought that Aristotle just didn't get Plato. You know, he was just, Finley's attitude is Aristotle's just a little bit thick and doesn't pick up, the, doesn't get it. Um, and I, I'd like to sort of suggest that um, what we need is a type of platonic tempering of uh, Aristotelian naturalism. Um, and the context in which I see Hegel is appealing to Plato to counter a limitation found in Aristotle's logic, but that flows into other things, um, limitation that has to do with his formalism, and the context is the account of the structure of the uh, cosmic animal or cosmic organism or whatever given in Plato's uh, Timaeus in Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy. Um, now that immediately sort of leads into sort of somewhat worrying territory. Um, Hegel certainly got into hot water um, in his 1801 thesis where he was accused of trying to um, sort of deduce the distances of the planets from the sun on the basis of um, this pile of numbers that you find in Plato in the Theaetetus. Um, I actually think he was doing something very different and something very interesting. Um, and it's going to, although I won't be talking about that, uh, you know, that work, it'll be in the context of the way that he kept on talking about the Timaeus in the lectures on the history of philosophy and much later. Um, so the, where I want to start is um, when Hegel starts talking about Plato's natur philosophy um, and describing Plato's idea of corporeal being as involving the fairest of bonds that makes itself with what it binds. Um, and he 
Sis, it quotes Plato. This is a quote from Plato. This brings into play in the most beautiful way the proportion or the continuing geometric ratio. In the middle, one of three numbers, masses or forces, is related to the third as um, I'm actually missing part of my text <laughs> on the side, uh, as it is to the first, and conversely, it's related to the first as, is, as it is to it. A is to B as B is to C. Then since the middle term has become first and last, and conversely, the last and the first have become the middle term, they have all become one. Um, after that, Hegel, uh, in his own voice, says, with this, the absolute identity is established. This is the syllogism known to us from logic. It retains the form in which it appears in the familiar syllogistic, but here as the rational. Now I take the familiar syllogistic um, to be referring to um, Aristotle's syllogistic, um, but here as the rational implies that it's not as the rational in Aristotle. In fact, a couple of pages later, um, he appeals to, he starts talking about um, the Verstandes Schluss, presumably talking about Aristotle, um, and trying to portray Aristotle's uh, syllogistic as a type of deformed form of the proper one that you get in, Hato, uh, in Plato. Now, I think one of the important things about this is Hegel's Plato. Um, I, Hegel, I think, uses Plato as an antidote to not only Aristotelian, but a type of combined Aristotelian Kantian form of formalist thinking. So the problem with Aristotle here in Hegel's account that Plato is brought in to correct um, is his limitation to der Verstand. Um, it's quite clear that um, Timaeus, uh, Plato's Timaeus, uh, the whole cosmology in that is built on um, Pythagorean music theory. I mean, there's no secret about that. Um, but it's only relatively recently been realized and um, a classicist in the 1930s, Benedict Ineson, pointed out that the entire terminology of Aristotle's syllogistic had been drawn from Pythagorean music theory. So some of the basic ideas of an interval, um, major, middle and uh, minor terms, the extremes, the division of an interval into, into smaller intervals and so on, um, all drawn from, um, Arist uh, from Pythagorean music theory and presumably via Plato, right? So hey, I think Hegel's got um, the history there seemingly right, that there's Plato's syllogism, which is heavily indebted to Platonic music theory, and Aristotle has sort of drawn upon um, that, uh, that background in constructing his own syllogism. Oops. Okay, so here's just um, a quote from um, Epinomis, which is a, a, it's a, a dodgy attribution to Plato, but nevertheless, it presumably captures certain things of Platonic philosophy, where Plato refers to a series of uh, four numbers that are usually referred to as the musical tetractus, um, sometimes as the harmonia, um, and the quote goes like this. The means of six in relation to 12 are determined by the ratios three is to two and four is to three. The sequence based on both of these means has been granted to the human race by the blessed choir of the muses and has bestowed upon us the use of concord and symmetry to promote play in the form of rhythm and harmony. Um, well, it may have been granted by the blessed choir of the muses, but it seems to have been more immediately granted by um, Archytas of Tarantum, who was a contemporary of Plato, um, um, a, a, a Pythagorean mathematician and um, statesman from, uh, from Italy. Um, and before him, Philolaus of Croton. Philolaus was approximately a contemporary of Socrates. So 
while in myth in the sort of mythology everything is referred back to Pythagoras, um, Pythagorean historians now are not even terribly sure there was a Pythagoras, right? But there was certainly a Pythagorean movement, and there was a Pythagorean movement of uh, in mathematics, which was very prominent around the time of uh, the academy, the early years of the academy. Okay, so. Plato is um, here talking about what Hegel refers to as um, see, um, the structure of um, the, the, corp the corporeal essence, I think. It's the, it is. Um, and he's talking about how the, the world as a three-dimensional sort of whole hangs together. So in this visible domain, then, there were as extremes, earth and fire, or the solid and what is filled with life. Um, what is what requires two me it requires two means because it has both breadth and also depth. So God set air and water between earth and fire, and via two ratios, so that fire is related to air and air is to water, and air is to water as water is to earth. Um, strangely, the translators of um, those passages in um, the English translation, um, Brown, I forget who it is, um, totally resistant to talking about two, <laughs> more than one sometimes it refers to, um, or some, or something like that. But Hegel is very insistent that there is two. Two means. Um, and um, so that was Plato. Now Hegel continues in his own voice. The middle term is therefore a broken one, hence the number four, which crops up here and which is a principle or basic number in nature, is the cause for what is one in thought entering into, sub into separation in nature. In other words, the middle term considered as antithesis is a doubled term. Now, I think the emphasis on the number four there, again, it's a reference to this Pythagorean idea of the Tetractus. Um, but when Hegel was into this stuff early on, um, uh, Franz von Bader was uh, writing about the relationship between the Trinity and this type of Pythagoreanism. And of course, the Trinity has got three in it, and Pyth the Pythagorean Tractatus has got four. And Hegel quite emphasizes the idea that once logic, as it were, gets into the world, it becomes fourfold. Um, when it's considered in sort of abstraction, it's, uh, it's, it's a three-part thing. And interestingly, um, in the science of logic, there's not much in the way of distinguishing between singularity and particularity in the first two books. Um, I've actually sort of gone through the occurrences of singularity. I think there's about 400 or something, and almost all of them are in the third book. So this idea of um, a type of structural change between the uh, the first two books and the third, I think coinciding with the idea that the type of, once logic gets into the world, it, it is structurally transformed. Go back to Plato and the musical Tetractus, the means of six in relation to 12 are determined by the ratios three is to two and four is to three. Now what's behind all that? Um, well, it's this. Um, there are three so-called means in um, Pythagorean music theory, the geometric, the arithmetic, and the harmonic. You still find them, you still find these three means in contemporary statistics. So it's, a, it's, it's not a type of way out sort of thing. So six and 12 belong to a geometric series, which doubles with each subsequent term. So if you like, think of six multiplied by the series, one, two, four, eight, 16 and so on. Um, that's the basic ratio involved is one is two, and this de defines the relation among octaves. So, you know, middle C, if you move to a uh, C an octave up, it's uh, twice the frequency of middle C. The trouble is um, the geometric mean only works for octaves. It doesn't work within octaves. And quite significantly, if you try and use the geometric mean within a octave, you get the most dissonant note, you get the so-called tritone, um, widely used in horror movies, that sort of like that, that, that interval. 
when you're within the octave, um, there's two um, for the Pythagoreans basic um, um, uh, consonant uh, intervals. They're the, the perfect fifth, you know, um, C to G uh, in sort of modern terminology, and the perfect fourth, C to uh, F. Um, and the mathematics of those, uh, the perfect fifth um, is the arithmetic mean of the extremes. That, so the arithmetic mean is halfway between the two. Um, so six is halfway between, a uh, nine is halfway between six and 12. Um, and the second harmonic mean is the um, perfect fourth. There's more complicated formula to get that, but it comes out at the number eight. So um, the numbers six, eight, nine, and 12 form this pattern um, of the three means. And uh, for hundreds of years after Plato, there are many, many attempts to work out um, comp these, the, the way these means are unified, They're supposed to sort of hang together in some way. Um, now, this sequence of numbers, the musical tetractus or the uh, harmonia, was believed to be what Plato had referred to with the beautiful proportion from the Timaeus. Right? It was thought to be the bond that holds the world together and the bond that holds thought together as well. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, series of ratios is that the ratios involved are incommensurable so that the unity um, among them is one among incommensurable components. The reason being is the role of squaring in, um, go back to here, the, so the geometric, a geometric mean, let's take the extremes of two and eight, the geometric mean is four, which is the square root of the product of two and eight, right? Now, once you introduce squares into this stuff, um, you get the problem of irrational numbers. And this was, this was a widely debated problem within Greek mathematics. And it sort of hit Athens, it's supposed to have hit Athens around the time of the, um, around the time of death of Socrates, actually. So a few, you know, 10 or so years before the formation of Plato's Academy. And a lot of Plato's um, dialogues had references to the problems of um, the discovery of the irrationals, because of course this sort of undermined the Pythagorean worldview as based on the, on the monas, based on arithmetic. So while Plato's syllogism had two middle terms between its extremes, Aristotle's had only one. So again, Hegel, in the syllogism of the understanding, there are two extremes and one middle term. This, while this avoids the problem of incommensurability, it's at the price of being unable to bind the extremes and middle terms into a unity. And that's how Hegel is going to approach it. Okay, so uh, I wanted, I've got five minutes left. <laughs> I want to sort of quickly jump into um, a, the topic that I had hoped to take up in that paper, which I never really got to. It was thinking about the relationship between in, 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 in the first book, or the only book really I've written on Hegel, in the 90s, um, I've taken these slogans from it where I talk about um, Zittlikart and its spheres, and I talk about the familial and the familiar sort of realm of, it's more or less, I suppose, Salazian manifest world. Um, and I talked about the epistemological and epistemology and the logic of the Berger. Um, you know, Berger, like a Gesellschaft, has a type of reflective culture and how Hegel tries to capture that in the encompassing context of the state. And I want to try and apply those ideas about the three means to that. Um, and here's where I try and pick up Terry's idea of the primacy of value over norms. Also, and, and again, um, found in Dean's most recent book, right? I mean, the, this idea that value uh, has a central place for Hegel. Um, in Terry's uh, book, um, it leads to a type of disenchanted Aristotelian naturalism that allows us to grasp the roots of value in nature. And that's obviously going to have 
an important implication for the relationship of mind and nature and the relationship of mind and nature um, in the various realms, I think of them as sort of cognitive realms of social life broken up into its three spheres. Um, now, so when you work your way through Hegel's series of judgments, there are judgments about familiar things, roses and so on. Um, and there are judgments which I call defamiliarizing Copernican judgments. They're sort of scientific image judgments. You get to the one from the other by a type of abstraction that's driven by negations. Um, and all these judgments ultimately come out in a type of evaluative judgment, right? Judgment about a good. The judgments of the concept uh, concerning um, good or bad human actions or human products. And that's the most developed form of concept because it um, goes into a syllogism, right? Um, and we're to understand the syllogism as the truth of the judgment. So this is presumably how we're to think of judgments per se. Uh, this house is good. Hegel sort of expands it into this house constituted thus and so is good, which is a type of syllogism. You can see it sort of, you know, you can uh, elaborate it in that type of Aristotelian way, although Hegel hates that type of Aristotelian syllogism. Um, it, it's circular. I think he's right. So um, he's, he's trying to avoid that sort of Arist direction in Aristotelian logic. Um, but very quickly, I want to suggest this is how it's supposed to hang together. I'll use, an anal I'll use a comparison between Hegel's familiar judgments, like the rose is red, and what Boole in the 19th century called primary judgments. His example was the sun shines. Boole said there were secondary judgments. It is true that the sun shines, that the sun shines is true. Hegel's primary judgments, the rose is red, and I think his equivalent of Boole's secondary judgments is something like it is true that the rose is red, and it's a response to its contradictory. It's false that the rose is red, right? So it's a type of abstract version of the primary judgment. Um, taken by itself, it actually leads into that crazy judgment called the um, infinite judgment, which just becomes empty. So Hegel's faith, like, like all those, like Boole was in the 19th century, Hegel was faced by the problem. How do you think of the judgments as related? And I've got a theory. Right. So Boole says secondary judgments are derived from primary judgments, but that doesn't work. We know that from Sellers's critique of the given. Russell says primary judgments are abstractions from secondary judgments. They're sort of propositional functions or fancy predicates. Um, I don't think that works. Um, Hegel, I think, says they've just got the same content under opposed and in fact incommensurable logical forms. And Hegel's thought, I think, is pretty much the intuition that goes into what's called the redundancy theory of truth, which says that it is true that the sun shines, simply says no more than the sun shines. The predicate true is redundant. There's no reducing, however, for Hegel, there's no reducing one form to the other because they've got logically different properties. Um, we could talk about that in, in the discussion, but they've diff definitely got diff logically different properties. Okay, that's my, sorry, time is up. Um, I think I've got one more slide. Um, back to music, just to try and cap off. Um, and this is sort of Pythagorean stuff, right? Um, something like a guitar is simply a machine for converting additive relationships into multiple, multiplicative ones. Anyone who's as old as me will remember using log tables at school. Um, the, gu the guitar neck is just a, like a log table. So a fourth and a fifth, as you can see there, fourth goes to the fifth. <laughs> Um, fret the fifth to the seventh fret, you add them up and you get an octave. But harmonically, a fifth multiplied by a fourth gives an octave, right? So you've got these two sort of different incommensurable um, arrangements 
with a type of equivalence, a type of equivalent mappings between them. Now there's a name for that in, um, in modern mathematics um, called a homomorphism. Um, and I think a, the idea of a homomorphism is, is essentially what Hegel thinks of as identity and difference. Um, and the having the difference in it is absolutely essential to um, avoid all those problems of uh, uh, Aristotelian formalism. So um, that's it. Um, um, someone said that um, those things were machine for killing fascists, um, but that one does maths at the same time. Thank you so much. Yeah, All right, so um, if you'd like to ask a question, just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you in the appropriate order. All right, let's start with Robert, with Bob Stern. Oh, sorry, thank you. Wasn't it Woody Guthrie who said that? Anyway. It was Woody Guthrie, yes. <laughs> um, well, not what, he didn't say what you said, but he said no. So, <laughs> the first bit. Paul, that was really fascinating, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure I fully got it, as it were. So I suppose I'm asking a selfish question, namely, what difference does what you said make to what I like to think about Hegel? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's go with the, the normative syllogisms at the end, the house is a good house, etc. Mm. Now, I guess I do think of that as pretty Aristotelian. You seem to have the form of a house, and this house does or does not conform to it, and that grounds the normative judgment. Is anything you've said about the structure of the syllogism, etc., does that show that I'm wrong to think of it that way? Or is that too Aristotelian in a way still because I'm missing something? Mm. I, I think um, the, a closer approximation to Aristotle is in the, ju was the, the judgment of necessity, I think, is the, in the cycle. I think of these things as going in cycles. It's the cycle before you get the judgment of the concept. I mean, that works with straightforward idea of, of kinds and essences and so on. And I read, I read Hegel's criticism of Aristotle there as saying that Aristotle can't do justice to individual instances of kinds, right? Um, think of Aristotle's um, um, sort of scientific logic, right? It's only about kinds. Um, it applies to, you know, you or me in as much as that we simply are instances of human beings. Um, there can't be anything like um, a, a consideration of individuals per se. Um, and I think Hegel wants to um, broaden Aristotle's categories. I think he thinks that Aristotle uh, collapses singularity and particularity. Um, both in his logic and in his metaphysics. And so can't capture the sense in which kinds are really dependent on the individuals who make them up. Right? Kinds are secondary substances, um, which seem to, for Aristotle, seem to have a type of primacy, <laughs> strange type of primacy of secondary substances. Um, so I guess that's that's where my answer would be going. I mean, in the stuff on the, that I distributed, um, the stuff on analysis and synthesis is, is effectively about that. Um, where um, I think his criticism of Aristotle is that Aristotle doesn't have the resources to distinguish between a particular, a particular instance of a universal, right? So, some rose or a rose um, from this rose. <laughs> um, and it's important that when Hegel talks about the house, it's this house, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a house that you're in front of um, and that's somehow sort of having an impact on you and your, uh, and your dispositions, your bodily dispositions. He's quite clear about that one's initial response to these things is a type of impulse. Um, it becomes rationalized once you get into the sort of debates about what, whether it's a good or a bad house. 
Um, and then that's when you start saying things like it's a good house because it has such and such, such and such features and you build it into a syllogism. Um, but I take his account of that judgment is um, pretty close to um, what, um, and I think they're in logic, they're very similar, what Peirce thinks of as abduction. It's a type of judgment, it's a type of extension of an experience into a generalization, like houses of this kind are good, and it's done on the basis of the experience of that house. So it's the specificity of the singular that I think that's non-Aristotelian, that's how I, singular terms don't properly get into Aristotelian syllogisms. Good, thanks. I mean, there's a lot I'd like to ask about, but let's, yeah, let other people come in. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, let's go to Dean next, Dean Ware. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, as you know, I'm very sympathetic to your view, but I guess I do want to hear more about the connection of the two kinds of judgment to the philosophy of right project specifically. Um, so picking up not so much on the harmonic stuff, but on the difference between inherence and subsumption, um, mm. judgments of inherence, judgments of subsumption and their relationship to the syllogism. Um, I mean, I appreciate, I totally appreciate your focus on singularity or in singular individuality, Einzelheit. I think it's mm. just sort of the great problem in understanding Hegel's logic is we have such a hard time getting a grip on that. Mm. Um, and then in the philosophy of right, of course, he tells us in section seven, which has gotten lots of attention, that this is individuality or singularity. But there it just sort of looks like the true infinite or the full structure of the concept, mm. or it seems again very much sort of um, you know, treated in a way that doesn't really make it clear how you could have this, this kind of doubled structure or the doubled middle that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the real question then is about your reading of ethical life, because I take it, you know, you do have some remarks about the family and the issue of immediacy that you bring up at the end of your paper. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, he tells us in the logic also that singularity is doubled. There's both the singularity as immediacy, mm -hmm. and there's the singularity as the full structure of the concept, and we're kind of left to sort out how those two senses are related to each other. And I gathered you were getting to that when you were talking about the familiar and the family. But I wanna hear more about how, I guess, to try to state it simply, how immediacy in your sense, which I think you're aligning with the judgments of inherence, how immediacy in that sense persists in ethical life and is mediated, taken up in ethical life I mean, so you, at one point you contrast a kind of subsumptive Fichtean model of recognition that's appropriate to civil society right. with a more uh, inherence-based, immediate conception of judgment and syllogism that would be more appropriate to the family. But I really wasn't sure in the end how you thought we could make that productive for our overall reading of ethical life or of the philosophy of right because of course we have these problems that Jay Bernstein was talking about yesterday. It seems like if you put too much emphasis on singularity, you're gonna end up sort of sabotaging ethical life. And so, yeah, if you could just sort of say more about how that works in your account. Um, yeah, thanks, Dean. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, a difficult one. Um, I see, um, I, I, my natural reaction is to go into sort of criticism of random mode, right? <laughs> That's the way that I've sort of always thought through these sort of things. Um, 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 so the, the sort of general critique of immediacy that usually goes under the title of, um, you know, um, critique of the myth of given and things like that. I mean, I think Hegel's got a good uh, argument, but that just leads to, leads to vacuousness, um, that, that leads, it totally depletes our judgments of any content whatsoever. Um, and I think the demonstration of that is in the logic in the first part of the judgment, 
where judgments go through these two types of negation and become more and more abstract. And you have this strange judgment called the infinite judgment, which is just a type of weird reflection on definitions or something like that, right? I mean, you know, the table is not an elephant or something like that. It's, it's like what you would tell someone who was learning a language and didn't realize that elephants were animals and tables were pieces of furniture, right? Um, it's, a, it's a type of um, judgment that's entirely dependent upon using first order judgments. And so, hey, I, I, that's why I like this idea that um, those two judgment forms just have a type of identity of content. Now, I mean, this is an idea I more or less took from um, um, the name, <laughs> sorry, his name just got straight out of my head. Um, Michael Boff, um, uh, and who, who talked about the idea of a sort of logical substrate of judgments. And he actually modeled it on um, various sort of developments in geometry in the 19th century that I think Hegel himself was extremely into, right? So, um, but without any of that background, this idea of a type of logical substrate, um, if, if we talk about um, you know, the rose is red in this, like this rose is red, something that's present to me and has me sort of built into it as the judge. Um, what's the relationship between that judgment and an entirely, as it were, objective judgment, right, if you like? There is something out there in the world which is a rose that it is red, but even though I've never seen it, something like that. Um, I think Hegel wants to say that um, there's just a bit of the world that has these sort of two perspectives onto it um, and that you can't get any, um, you can't take it apart any further than that, right? So you can't, you know, talk about the logical form of the objects in the world without a reference to this sort of breaking apart. This is the splitting type of language. I mean, you know, the, the very idea of a judgment is something that splits, right, you know, for Hegel. Um, so where was I in that? So the immediacy thing, I, I want to say that things like um, affective judgments have to be a part of moral life. I mean, the idea of trying to lead a moral life void of emotion or affect, I think um, Hegel would regard as crazy. Um, the idea of trying to lead a theoretical life, um, believing in um, being as critical of the myth of the given as you find in people like Richard Rorty, <laughs> is also um, uh, renders that theoretical life impossible. But I mean, there's got to be some type of connection to our immediate dispositions, our responses to the world, they of course have to be correctable. I mean, we've got to learn that, you know, the sun actually doesn't rise um, in the east and go around the earth and set in the west and so forth. I mean, you know, the modern world is Copernican and it has this type of defamiliarization built into it. But it's not, the, it's not as if we can sort of just go down that path and become like ultra theoretical. Um, which I think is built into those ideas of, for example, Leibniz, the type of ladder up to the, you know, the God's eye point of view and so on. Hegel's logic, as I understand it, he wants to keep on recycling, reinterpreting um, this type of worldly input that we have in virtue of being organisms, right? And interacting, having causal interactions with them. He, just, he never wants to get away from that. It's not as if that, just sort of is a subjective, something that sullies our better judgments. We wouldn't have judgments at all unless we had those. So it, it's that uh, keeping the family in the picture right, by all those sort of devices of trying to make the state have um, an element of the family, like his support of the monarchy and so forth, I see as, as doing that. Um, 
and uh, only it's only um, in virtue of having this break into what are just simply um, uh, incompatible in incommensurable forms of logical systems right? i think if you took the, the familiar judgments and worked out the logical system of that it would be you'd probably get some, I think you get something like intuitionist logic, right? Um, and if you work out the logical system of reflective judgment, you get something like Frege. And Hegel just wants to say, look, they're just, they're just abstractions, right? I mean, that's what, if you get into this sort of business of trying to axiomatize our thoughts and things like that, you'll end up there. But um, they're both manifestations of, um, attitudes that demand each other, that depend on each other. You can't understand one without the other. Um, I know that's a sort of a fairly trite way of putting it, but um, I think the idea of um, the, the, the sort of homomorphic idea that I was trying to get at before um, is, is an interesting way of trying to think about the relationships there. I don't know if that... No, that's good. That's you know, great. Thank you. I'm going to exercise chair's privilege and bump Terry to the front and let you go ahead, Terry. Okay, I, th I think I'm live now. Um, I have two questions, one of which is related actually to the paper that Jay gave yesterday. I mean, the first question is, uh, you want to draw some conclusions about the failure of Aristotelian logic to have a place for singularity in it. And, um, now, this you know, brings up the Ophragus criticism of Aristotelian logic, which was, the same, which was that there was no place for singularity because Aristotle couldn't distinguish between class inclusion and class membership. Mm. Here. Uh, so this is, that's one issue, which I think you, know, you mm. can just nail Aristotle on. So Frege and Hegel were both right about that. But then there's a separate kind of metaphysical issue. You can think of this like the Crinus, Robert Stern view about what natural kinds are, how to think of natural kinds, and that's not solved by simply pointing out that Hegel has failed to include, uh, not Hegel, Aristotle has failed to distinguish class inclusion from class membership. That's the first thing. So that's a separate issue. And the mere, merely pointing to singularity, Hegel in the logic, you know, uses this abstruse German term, monstrieren, right? That the das Einzelne kann nur monstrieren werden. Right? You only point at it here. Mm. But that's a separate issue now from, like I say, the Krinus Stern view about what natural kinds are and so on. Uh, the other one is that you have this view, as you stated it here, that there's a fourth, there's a split middle term here. There's a fourth, by the way, we should think of syllogisms as not in terms of threes, but fours. Mm. But now, going back to Dean's question in the philosophy of right, right, you have family, civil society, and state. Jay says that's singularity, particularity, and universality. Where's the fourth? The fourth always comes in when you, it's, well, the, the, the middle term always splits because it has to play a different role in relation to the first than it plays in relation to the third. That's my way of thinking about it, right? Um, a predicate, let's see. Um, why don't Aristotelian syllogisms tolerate singular terms, right? It's because Aristotelian syllogisms have to use both subject and predicates as subjects and predicates, right? They have to be able to swap around. And Aristotle doesn't think that a singular, a singularity, a singular term can be a predicate, okay? So Hegel's tried to get some sort of sense of the way to relate singulars in the sense of the things you point to, so immediate concrete singulars, to the more indefinite sense of an instance of a kind. Right? This rose versus a rose. Right? Because you've got to use both. For, for Hegel. You can only do logical inferences if you 
talk about roses in general. But you can only ever get content into inferences if you talk about this rose and that rose. That's how, how I see it. Um, so Hegel's going beyond Fichte's criticism of Aristotle, I think. Um, Fichte's problem is that he's only got extremely abstract, indeterminate idea of singularity himself. Right. Fichte, the Fichte problem is the, the problem of what he thinks of as existential judgments, right? I mean, there is something that is a rose and that is red, right? I mean, there's a property of the universe that it contains a red rose or something like that. But Hegel's, Hegel's singular judgments are the sort of things we think of, you know, in everyday life. I mean, it's about this thing. Um, it's not, you know, the sort of think of the shorter spy or whatever, right? I mean, that type of stuff. Um, what, what would be the example, just concretely, right? You have family, civil society, and state. That seems like a three pronged syllogism. Right. There should be a fourth element there. Now, yesterday, for example, Lydia was suggesting about, you know, you have one thing that represents something, uh, Andrea, one thing that represents one thing, represents something in the next sphere. But that's not going to give you four. That's going to give you, you know, six. Um, so what, what it, where, where right. is the fourth element in the syllogism about Zitlischkeit? Um, Singularity is particularly, you know, civil society, family, civil society. You're state. talking about them like you can sort of separate them out. And so, you know, there's one on the left-hand side of my desk, there's one on the right, and there's one in the middle. And it just, I don't think it works like that. Um, the whole idea of the three related, I mean, I, you know, if we take this idea of that he quotes from Plato about the three means, the middle becoming the extremes and all that, I mean, he means it, right? It's not just sort of, um, this sounds cool. I mean, he's really embracing that idea. And I, I take it that we're supposed to take it seriously. Um, and he says that um, Feshtant just takes the ends, the, the extremes as sort of self-sufficient and doesn't grasp the degree to which they play the role of middles in different contexts. And I mean, if you think of how, how, how problematic this whole three part structure is, um, I mean, when you get to the in, in, end of the encyclopedia, right, there's those three or four paragraphs that come before the famous Aristotle quote, where he, he virtually says, look, we've been through this sort of <laughs> from start to finish, I mean, this huge type of journey, but we could have gone through it through two other different ways. I mean, you know, he sort of throws these sentences off. Um, we could have started with spirit um, instead of logic. We could have started with nature. And the contents of all those things presumably would have been different. Um, <laughs> um, so, I look, I, you know, I... I just don't think there's an there's a sort of a quick answer to say where's the fourth right? Um, so families the family's got elements of civil society just as civil society has elements of family. Right? I mean um, these the the type of division is projected into into those things. Um, I mean this is. He's, um, he says this really interestingly about um, maths. He says continuous magnitudes have discrete magnitudes within them and discrete magnitudes have continuous magnitudes within them. That's totally contrary to Kant. It's totally contrary to Schelling and these sorts of people. He's, he's always got this idea that what look like two different things actually contain um, that which differentiates them in both of them, right? they, and, and so it's that's where where you put the emphasis. So I don't think there is. I don't think you can just sort of say. I don't think it means much to say where's the fourth. Um, it's about how we're thinking of these things as related to each other um, in this structure. Now, I, I I think I mean it's hard. It's hard to. I mean it's hard to make sense of Hegel's rhetoric. I mean his own language. But I mean, I think there is a, a way of 
you know, maybe that we can make sense of it. I mean, if we do take these sort of hints um, about the uh, about music um, seriously, um, you know, there's there's a sort of a, a a way of filling out this story in ways that make it more than a bit of sort of crazy, you know, um, rhetoric that you know. Uh, like uh, there was a lot of that going on, going on in that time. You know, I mentioned Franz von Bader and people like that. But I mean, I think Hegel was actually making something of it. I don't think it's just uh, a type of rhetorical flourish or a type of symbolism. You know, that you can't cash out in any other way or something like that. So I know I'm not answering <laughs> answering your question, but I, I don't I, I don't think it's um, I don't I don't think it's an answerable. I don't, I don't think the idea that there is an answer in that simple way is what I'm trying to suggest. All right, so we've got a couple hands up. Let's go to Leonard Weiss. Hello, so uh, thank you very much for this talk. So if I understood you correctly, you pointed out that um, Hegel's uh, account of the syllogism isn't all Aristotelian, at least not in every respect, because he includes certain ideas uh, from Plato that he finds missing. Um, so my impression of the of the text in, in the in the third book of the logic is also that Hegel seems to be dissatisfied with the account of the syllogism, even the one he himself promotes to a certain extent feels a need to go beyond it, uh, which then sort of motivates the transition to objectivity. Yeah. Um, and now this certainly is a move that that leads even further into Aristotelian terrain uh, by like adopting some sort of perspective that is at least very close to the hylomorphism that is operative in, in Aristotle's metaphysics. Mm. Um, so do you think that this somehow like helps to solve the problems you pointed out in, in the, that Hegel sees with the Aristotelian version of the syllogism, or do you think that a similar problem maybe arises again on, on that level of the analysis? Um, thanks for, the, for your question. Um, uh, let's see. I, Where he, I mean, he clearly embraces a lot of Aristotelianism. I'm not trying to deny that, right? Um, but I think the Arist I think the Aristotle that he embraces is heavily Platonic, right? That's my understanding. Um, even uh, right, I, think, I, I mentioned the sort of you know that famous passage from the Metaphysics that he quotes at the end of the Encyclopedia. Um, why? I mean, it's, it sounds like. Timaeus's cosmic animal life, <laughs> um, to me. And why is it Aristotle? Well, I think he does. I think he wants to get rid of Plato's god, right? I mean, the, the artificer. So, that, so he wants to just go with, the, as it were, the world soul without an artificer. Um, But the, the again getting the getting getting the sort of content into the Aristotelian syllogism. I, so I, I tend to think of the, the first two books or the second book in particular, the sort of heavily uh, you know, Aristotelian in the sort of framework. And of course, there's the sort of Kantian switch uh, at the beginning of the third book, the, the acknowledgement of Kant. Um, and you go through the subjective logic and it sort of gets this strange filling out, right? Um, and it, I think it gets filled out by, by the subjects of singular judgments. Um, uh, there's this famous letter between, a series of letters between Russell and Frager, where Frager says to Russell, you sound as if you're saying that when you think of when you think the judgment Mont Blanc is in snow or something like that, um, Mont Blanc is a part of the judgment. And Russell goes, yeah. <laughs> um, and he sort of ended that he soon changed to Frege's view. But I think Hegel is a sort of would say, yeah, right? um, why not think of the content of the judgment as the thing? Right? So as where thoughts have got content and the contents are the things that the thoughts are about. It's, a, it's not a terribly stupid idea, I think. Um, and I see the 
formal logic as they're being repopulated by this sort of content by that sort of mechanism. So you, yes, you end up with um, another version of the type of Aristotelian uh, category theory that you had in the first, well, first two books, but it's somehow been transformed because it's come out of this subjective logic with its, I think, very, very un-Aristotelian shape in terms of the shape of judgments that go into it. Um, again, singular judgments, I mean, there are, there are singular judgments in Aristotle, of course, and the, I mean, he, he sort of has a whole lot of allusions to them, but um, there's no official place for singular judgments in Aristotle's logic. Um, and I think what Hegel was doing is using Aristotle against himself to, to, to make this um, logic more Platonic, more Leibnizian at the same time. I mean, Plato and Leibniz, I think, are fairly closely aligned. Okay, well, we're out of time, but I wanted to give Luke O'Sullivan a chance to just ask his question because he's been waiting patiently since the beginning. So go ahead and then we'll take a break after that. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the organizers presenters for a, for a fascinating conference. Uh, when I was listening uh, to, to this, I wondered if uh, you were going to talk about the philosophy of nature at all. And um, this offers a very interesting way of explaining Hegel's logic, but I wondered if this double middle, doubled middle term idea also is something that Hegel is using there, because I've always been puzzled in the encyclopedia volume on the philosophy of nature. Hegel says that when we get to the dialectic in nature, it's tetradic. And one of the things that I think he's thinking about there is that there's the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And that's the yeah. kind of Aristotelian theory of the elements, uh, which is kind of neo-scholastic in, in Hegel. But, you know, is it that Hegel is also thinking of, you know, the, these four elements as just the material instantiation of this kind of logical relationship of the double middle doubled middle term you know that you're, you're saying you find in in plato so um, can, yeah, we, uh, yeah. can we extend your naturalism to, to that is that where where you want to go with this potentially uh, as an explanation of the philosophy of nature as well which could also you know add to the understanding of the logic yeah, yes, indeed. I, I, mean, I, I think that um um this fourfold thing certainly is, i mean it's not only aristotle that has those sort of elements of course i mean the whole Street background has those elements, um, and uh, the, 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 the interesting opposition between three-part structures and four-part structures, um, I think, uh, has to do with when you do logic without thinking of its application, it all looks okay in sort of three. But once you start thinking of it um, as a logic of the world, which Hegel wants to do, I mean, it's that's the, that's the aim, it's to get to something like um, the logic of the world. Um, he wants to have this four part thing and, and yes, you're right. I mean, that's why in the, um, in the philosophy of, of um, nature, um, it's sort of it's seen as tetradic. Um, so no, I mean, I'll just, yeah, I agree. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for this great paper, this great discussion. So we're going to take a five minute break. We'll come back at uh, five minutes after the hour and start promptly. Thank you. Thank, thanks, thanks to everyone, to all the questions are wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I hope you don't mind. If